Hello everyone, welcome. So I'm Nathan and this is Paul. We're both the directors of the Australian Robotics Group. And we're joined today with Mike, uh, by Mike Zimmerman, Zimmerman, who's one of the lead investors at Main Sequences, which is one of Australia's biggest um, investment companies. Mike, why don't you tell us a bit about yourself and Main Sequence? Sure, thank you, Nathan, for having me. Good to see you, Paul. Um, as you said, I'm, I'm Mike Zimmerman. I'm a partner at Main Sequence Ventures, which is a relatively new deep tech fund. Uh, we were set up in partnership with CSRO um, to help back and create companies that are global companies that are commercializing the best research out of Australia. Uh, we invest in themes and uh, one of those themes, I guess, relevant for this discussion is um, exponential machines. And so we're excited about the possibilities from um, new computing and communications platforms, as well as all sorts of applied AI and uh, solutions for industrial automation, things like that. So, and I guess I, of note, um, well, not just me, but I, I've got in my personal portfolio that I look after at main sequence, um, yourself, obviously at Prescient, uh, Emerson, which is uh, in the economy and, and data analytics space, uh, LumaChain, which works in supply chain visibility and traceability in the agriculture sector, um, Casada, which is in cybersecurity and Fluorosat, um, which is analytics uh, for both agronomy and sustainability in ag. But we also have investments in Muriota and uh, Muriota and Baraha. And so we've got other kind of various companies in sen advanced nav, which is doing advanced sensing and autonomy and things like that. Yeah, that's really cool. So there's um, some interesting names in there. How much would you rate uh, robotics as an investment priority for you guys? Um, well, for, yeah, I'd say it's, it's definitely a core theme, but, um, or it's a core area, but I'd say it's, if I look at robotics, it's, it's, it's more about the, the industry and the type of solution and robotics is kind of the enabling technology to get there. Sure. Um, and, and also, I would say that, so we're, no, we're not only interested in, uh, I mean, we're interested in these themes and robotic solutions that solve problems in these theme, these various theme areas we have. But then we're also interested in the components of robotics. And so it could be that like advanced nav that's making a particular kind of advanced sensing solution or yourselves at Prescient doing the computer vision side of things or you know, we're looking at some companies that are doing more um, the software side of robotics. So it's not just um, like robotics in the traditional things, things of like a control, an automated or autonomous control system that can do X, Y, and Z, but it's actually, we are interested in the enabling technologies as well. Yeah, so that's really interesting, right? Because um, coming from a technological point of view, it's very easy to get it you know, obsessed or focused on one of the little niches, but it's very interesting to hear the, in, the investment sides, perhaps more focused on the application of the technology rather than just hmm. the name of the technology. I think that's, yeah, I think that's really key because it could be that you're, you have a very cool robot that is solving a problem nobody cares about um, or, you know, is is basically not working in an industry that has a lot of spare cash to throw at new types of technology solutions because the, the problem they're solving doesn't create much value or the industry is shrinking or what have you. And so I think it's really got to be a combination of the right technology applied at the right, you know, problem. Okay, that's interesting. So this kind of leads into my next question anyway, which is, can you, can you describe the best way for a, a robotics company out there to approach your firm and perhaps tell you the story? Yeah, um, can definitely just reach out to me if they want. So Mike at MSEC, 
uh, .vc or hit us up on, on socials or come to our website and submit uh, something there. It's not, uh, you know, we don't have these huge walls up. So just, uh, but possibly the, actually an even better way is to get a referral into us. Contact someone like yourself that actually knows what they're talking about. And uh, I'll wait for you to be the filter for opportunities that get sent my way. Hey, Mike, I think this is worth looking at. Like that goes a long way versus some, somebody just email me, emailing me. Right, so create more work for Nathan. Good plan, Mike. <laughs> what kind of story would you be interested in hearing from those companies? Something perhaps leaning more towards what they actually do for uh, their customers? Yeah, so for us at the highest level, we're looking to back um, companies with global ambitions that have the potential to be worth, um, you know, to generate, uh, we like to say, $100 million in revenue, at least have the potential to generate that over time, um, if everything goes well. Obviously, not every company is going to get to that level, but in other words, they need to have uh, a a story and a plan and a technology and a problem set that would allow them to get to that level of scale. So global and $100 million of revenue plan. And I think that's quite a good filter for a lot of things. If there's a company that just wants to be, you know, a niche company selling in Australia, New Zealand, that, you know, grows to, to $5 million in value, that could be a great business for the entrepreneur, but not necessarily a good fit for us. So. Excellent. So, so what about, so we have these traditional kind of fears, I guess, being on uh, this side of the table that hardware is hard, um, should never propose a high capex kind of project because high capex is very, very scary to start. But yeah. I'm curious, do you, do you find these kind of, uh, you know, hardware investments difficult to invest into? Um, well, I, th I think it depends. I, I think they do have, um, you know, they do have a high bar against them, but again, I come back to the problem that you're solving and what kind of customer, you know, pain there is. So if I look at you guys as an example, um, you know, you have a hardware solution, but it's, it's powered by very smart software. Your, your hardware looks great and it, you know, there's definitely been, uh, a lot of investment and in, in smarts put into it, but it's about your software. And more importantly than that, you're solving a problem that um, customers care about and we can see as investors the pain that the customers have. And so, yeah, I was thinking about this before our call and I think it's the thing we're gonna be looking for is yeah, a big problem, um, you know, in some way of convincing us that it's a big problem. Maybe it's going to be that you've, you've talked to customers about it and, and someone yet yeah, at Rio Tinto or, you know, a manufacturing company or an ag company says, yeah, if so-and-so could do this, that would just solve a huge problem for me because of, you know, X, Y, Z and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I can really easily quantify the, the value of that kind of solution. Um, and I can't wait to get my hands on it. Like that's the ideal. You don't always get that. But if you could talk to a, a beta customer or even like an advisor to the company that's from, you know, a sector where they can sort of vouch for the value of the solution, I think that that goes a long way in an emerging, uh, emerging technology area. I think the, um, the other part of the hardware is, um, you know, if I think that the hardware investments we've been making, They've been where the hardware, it's not a massive CapEx solution. I mean, maybe you have to buy some equipment or you know, invest in a lot of the, um, uh, the inventory so that you have stock and all that. But I don't think, you know, I, I think it'd be hard for us to back a company that makes a piece of kit that costs, has a bomb of like a million dollars. I'd be preferring to, to invest in something that has like a sub hundred thousand dollar bomb and then can sell it on a value, you know, value basis for, you know, a big multiple of that. And if I look at, you know, Emerson or your stuff, 
you know, you've got a kind of bite-sized hardware bomb. Um, that means you can get a lot of units out the door to a lot of different customers and um, start to grow your, mat, your, your, your market quickly, as opposed to someone who's building something that costs a million dollars where, geez, it's probably gonna take a long time to sell that piece of kit. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't know how many of those customers there are out there in the world. Yeah, it's very interesting, right? It's a, it's a big difference. And obviously there are some robotic solutions that will cost a million dollars, but perhaps they're um, better directed somewhere else than the ventures. Yeah, well. I think it's a good, yeah, we were talking just the other day, right about the autonomous trucks and how much they cost. And so we probably are not gonna be the investor in an autonomous trucking company, but maybe we'll invest in a company making the, you know, the autonomy systems or, some of the key components, the, the LiDAR, like a Baraha, you know, the LiDAR we have, um, something like that. Yeah, so the, the, the tech component producers rather than integrators. Okay, Mike, so the million dollar question, how, how can we make Australian robotics more investable? Yeah, great. Well, yeah, we're super excited to invest in more robotics companies. I'd say there's a handful of things you can do. Number one is um, all of our companies in the robotics space are looking for talent. And so if there's anything we can do to produce more mechatronics and, and AI engineers and, and hardware engineers, folks who are um, you know, gonna be staffing up these companies, I think that'd be awesome. Number two is we're always looking for strong validation from credible customers. So even if, um, you know, companies not delivered a product, if Robotics Australia maybe had access to people like at the Rio Tinto, you know, Pioneer Lab or folks like that who could validate or vouch for or give input into solution, new solutions to make sure they were gonna be very credible and kind of leading edge and solve a real problem. I think that would be great if you could get that, that kind of support from, from corporates. I think also um, another thing to remember is we don't have as investors unlimited money. If you need $10 million to you know, produce your first product or for your first round of funding, that's gonna just be that much more to challenging to get. And so I think you need to be able to show meaningful progress with realistically you know, probably $5 million or, or less to start with. And maybe if you're a seed stage company, even less. And then the other side of that is during your round of funding, you need to be able to show a, some kind of step change in, in what you've done, whether it's getting customer traction or achieving something great on, this, on the science or engineering side. Uh, within kind of 18 to 24 months, you've gotta have hit a bunch of milestones in 18 to 24 months for you to increase your value. So you've gotta not only need to consume not consume tons of capital, but also make meaningful progress within a reasonable period of time. So I think if you can do all those things, talent, corporates, not huge dollars and meaningful progress, geez, okay, we'll so be world great. leader. Get, get more people to come through that can make a difference. Yeah. Get more people that are already out there involved in making the difference and make sure everyone's playing the same game. Yeah, there you go. Okay, thank you very much for your time, Mike. We'll uh, leave it at that nice and short and sharp. Um, and hopefully we can make Australia a better place. Awesome.